All right, my name is John Nedry. I am new to the area, new to the group. Uh, I've been here for four or five months now. I brought, came here for a job. I work at Mercy Health. I'm the director of creative services there. So um, happy to be here. I uh, participated in the last two GRIP uh, conferences, and uh, that's kind of how I got to my invitation here. So. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my search for my dad's great grandfather, and more accurately, who who he was, who his ancestors were. He's our brick wall. Um, he's been a brick wall in our family for as long as anybody can remember. All we know about him is what he told his kids and what his kids passed down. So if you if you have a brick wall like that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So um, let's get started. This is uh, searching for William Henry Jones. This is William Henry Jones. Uh, by look, looking at that, I know what you're saying. You're saying, I can tell where John gets his ruggedly handsome good looks. <laughs> Actually, he looks a lot like my brother. He doesn't look like me. But um, this is what we're going to be talking about. And this is his wife, Flora Bell. And I can tell by looking at her that you're thinking that's where he gets his sense of humor <laughs> and his jovial attitude. So I want to get started. I just want to ask some questions so I know, get a sense for the group, and I know um, what your experience level is. So how many of you uh, would say that you're very experienced working with DNA? Okay. How about somewhat experienced? All right, we got about half. Familiar, but not real experience. Okay. Barely experienced? Okay, and how many of you don't even know what DNA is? <laughs> All right, so that's progress. You know, the funny thing is, the first year that I went to GRIP, there was, I don't know, like 50 of us in the crowd, and this was four years ago. And the first question they asked was, how many of you have tested your DNA? And it was less than a third raised their hands. And the next year, it was a little bit over half, and I think last year, it was just about everybody. I think it was everybody in the room, so. So are you using, those of you that are using DNA, are you using it to break down a brick wall? Okay, so those of you that are trying to break down a brick wall, how far back are you are you going? Great grandparents? Four, five, four. Okay, four generations, five generations. All right, so where have you tested and uploaded? Um, ancestry. Good. My heritage? Uh, about four or five, maybe six. Transfers. Okay, either one will count as long as they have your your results. Family tree DNA. Wow, quite a few. A little over half. 23 and me. A little over half. And who's on GEDmatch? Wait, let me do this. Who's not on GEDmatch? Two. Three, four. Okay. Um, and then who's done living DNA? One, two, three. Okay. All right, good. And then how many of you have tested or uploaded with all of those? One, two of us. How about five of them? All right, good. Well, that's, that's good. So for those of you that are expecting a really complicated in-depth presentation tonight, it's not gonna be that. In fact, I'm gonna talk a lot about how this needs to be simpler. Um, I've been to a lot of sessions, I've done a lot of seminars, I've read a lot, I've done all the things that you need to do, and I understand how to do the really complicated things, but you can do a lot of this stuff without making it complicated. A lot of what you need to do, you don't ever have to understand how to do chromosome painting or, or you know, any of that kind of stuff to be able to get this stuff done. So we're going to talk about how to make this as simple as possible. And I think for most people, that's the key. I think a lot of people get started and they get overwhelmed and they freak out and they don't know what to do. For those of you that are very advanced, I apologize if this isn't, compl isn't complicated enough. We can talk afterwards and I can complicate it up a lot if you'd like. <laughs> So the idea is when you get started with this, you need to sit down and make a plan. Because if you don't make a plan, you're not gonna get there. You're not gonna know what you need to do. You're gonna do what I did for two years, which is just kind of flail around, and you'll start researching one line, and all of a sudden you'll see something interesting, and the next thing you know, you're down that rabbit hole. And you'll be halfway down that, and you'll see something interesting, and you go in another direction. Having a plan helps you stay focused and helps you get to where you need to be going. Speaking of that, uh, about three months ago, I was at my computer working on my, working on my research, and I had a message pop up 
in Ancestry, which is always a very exciting thing, especially when you don't have any messages out to anybody, so it's unsolicited. And I went to it and the person said, hi, we're related um, fairly closely. And it was the typical, do you know how we're related thing. And so I responded the way I usually do with that. And I went and looked at all my tests, looked at how I connected to this person and wrote back and said, well, from what I can tell, it looks like we're probably related this way. It's probably this distance. Judging by who we have in common, I'd say you're probably the great granddaughter of so-and-so. And my bet is that your dad is probably one of these children or something like that. It's, I don't think I got quite into that detail, but it was something generally like that where I was probably showing off a little bit and trying to, trying to see how right I could be by guessing. And I sent it off and the next day I got a response from her and she said, I don't know who my dad is. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. And I probably should have thought of that before I responded to her, but, and she said, I'm not trying to find my dad. I'm just trying to find out if I have some siblings, it would be great to find out. And I'd like to find out for, for medical purposes, what, what my family line is. So we corresponded a few times. I struggled quite a bit with the right response to her because there's a whole ethical issue. I'm basically, as one person said, throwing a hand grenade into that part of the family. If I, you know, sort of let the cat out of the bag, I, I did a little bit more looking and I'm fairly confident. I know exactly who her father is, but um, I responded to her and I was a little bit cagey at first, knowing that if I, if I were to help her with that, then there's a good chance, this is the selfish part, there's a good chance that some of the people that I've asked to test would hear about this and come back to me and go, I don't want my DNA being used for that, take my test down. So I was concerned about my research, but at the same time, I respected her desire to find out what she wanted to find out. Ultimately, I talked to some experts. I actually talked to an ethicist that I work with, and um, we came up with the conclusion that what I would do is I would offer to help her learn how to do this. And she could research it on her own. She could find the solution. It was a pretty simple solution to find. So we agreed to set up a phone call and she never called. So the next week I emailed her and I said, you know, not sure what happened, but just so you know, I'm still available if you want to do it. If you don't, that's fine. And she said, sorry, things got crazy last week. We had to take some of the hospital. Next Sunday, I'll call you. And she never called. So I'm expecting someday I'll get the call, but um, it's a resolved issue right now. In the meantime, she gave me, she shared her results with me. So I have yet another kit that I can use for my research. So there was a plus. But that's an example of how there will be curveballs. You can make your plan. But as you start going forward, unexpected things will happen. Um, Mike Tyson once said, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. So that was, a, that was the equivalent of a punch in the mouth for me. Um, I struggled with it a lot for a few days. And uh, hopefully um, at some point, if, if her father is who I think it is, and it's, I'm 99% sure it is, he passed away like five years ago. So... Um, and I did confirm that the, the year that she was born was before he was married. So at least those issues don't appear to be like they're going to be a problem for that part of the family. So let's talk about William Henry Jones. Here's what we think we know about William. He was born in 1853 in Lancashire, England. His parents, this, now this is all what he told his children. His parents wanted him to be a minister. They were going to send him to seminary. His sister was already in the nunnery or the convent or whatever, whatever it was called. Um, but they wanted to send him, and he didn't want to do that. So at 12 years old, he stowed away on a ship, came to America, and uh, then everything is a big mystery. <laughs> and he was fascinated with the Wild West, and what he said is he made his way west, wound up finding his way to Wild Bill Hickok, rode with him, wound up being a sheriff somewhere, did cattle drives to Mexico, talked about how great the Mexican people were, they were so friendly. Um, we know that his, he then eventually made his way back, wound up in Michigan, married his wife in 1886. We have a census record that said he was in, naturalized in 1891 but we've never been able to find any naturalization records for him. And then he died in 1928. We know from what he said that his mother's name was Mary Kay. His father's name was George Jones. His grandfather, Mary Kay's 
father was Andrew Kay, and he said he had three siblings, or at least his family remembered three siblings named Cecily, Helen, and George. So that's all we have, and we've asked every descendant that we can find what the family story is, and it's the same story from everybody. There's no additional details, no fewer details. It's always the same story. So how do we solve it? How do we get to the bottom of this big mystery? The problem that we had once we started digging, traditionally digging, was the needle in the haystack. Um, anybody that, who has a Jones in their family tree that you've researched? If, if, if you look around, you'll see the people that raise their hands have extra like stress lines and stuff like that <laughs> from trying to research Joneses. So this is just one page that it's typically, I mean, it's a typical thing when you're trying to look at Joneses, especially in England, especially at this time, the name William Jones is just everywhere. So we spent years, my aunt, who's the, the, the real genealogist in the family, hired somebody to look into things. We looked into things. We've done a ton of research and just can't get anywhere with this. We've never been able to get anywhere. So when DNA came along, um, I told my aunt about it and I was getting into it and she was very excited. The first thing we focused on was my dad's grandmother on the other side, which was another brick wall. And that one we solved uh, in a couple of months. And since then I've had like, I don't know, what is it? Uh, it's about 15 circles in Ancestry for that line, and it's just every relative, every new relative that pops up on Ancestry is on that line. So now I'm sick of them. I want them to go away. I want to focus on this one. And they just keep getting in the way of my research. But anyway, um, so we tried to dig and dig and dig. Couldn't find anything. DNA looked like the solution where we want to start digging into this. So where do we start? How do we get this going? So here's the line. There's a lot more detail here that I'm not showing, but I wanted to keep it simple. Here's where my dad fits in with William Henry Jones and his parents. His mother is William Henry's daughter. Okay, so keep that in mind as we talk about what kind of test we can do. Most of you will probably know this, but will, di will Y-DNA help us in this? My dad is the blue one, bottom left. Second from the left. Okay, so there's no direct male line there. The two uncles, I don't show the detail of kids and stuff, but the two uncles didn't have kids. The women had a ton of kids, but the two uncles never had kids. One didn't have kids, the other one um, was, came back shell-shocked from World War I and just never really um, part participated in society after that. So there's no male line to help us with this search. This would have, would have been done ages ago. If we had a male line, we could have, we could have tracked this through. At least I think so. What about empty DNA? Is that going to do us any good? It might. But the thing with empty DNA is that we would want to use it to confirm something. And there's really nothing here. You know, there's nobody that we want to test or anything like that. So that's, it's not really going to help us. What about XDNA? XDNA could help here. Um, it's not, there's nothing that's really jumped out at us as we've tried to use XDNA. Um, does everybody understand how XDNA works? Basically, the way XDNA works is you can, rather than talk about how it works biologically, let's just say this. There are, there are certain lines on your pedigree that XDNA is transferred from one generation to the next. It will be passed from a mother to a daughter or a mother to a son, but it won't be passed from a father to a son or a daughter. So, so basically the way it looks when you look at the chart is there's very clear paths of inheritance for XDNA. So if you had somebody that you're an XDNA match to, you can get a nifty little chart, look at where you fit on it, look at where their tree fits on it, and you can see the areas hopefully, well, it, it helps you narrow down the people that you might be looking at. So it's a very, very useful tool. I would encourage you if you, aren't familiar with how it works, do a little digging online. There's a lot of blogs about it. There's Blaine Bender's blog has a really, really good article about how to use XDNA. Huge help, um, just hasn't helped in this case yet. So then the question is, knowing all of that, which site should we be testing with? So why DNA doesn't help us, empty DNA is not gonna help us, and FTDNA is the only company that does those, so FTDNA isn't necessary. 
So are there any other relatives tested on other sites? If there are, they're too far away for us to really know that they're relatives along these lines. So we're not sure. Ultimately, I, all of the tests that I've tested, I wound up transferring to every other site that I could possibly transfer to. So we kind of have those bases covered. But what it comes down to is the size of the database. Ancestry is where I've done 90% of my work, maybe 99% of my work on this. Um, and it's where most of the matches are coming up too. I just had a new one last week. They just keep popping up. So um, it used to be we'd have big long discussions about which site to test with. It's getting to the point, and people will disagree with me, but it's getting to the point that if you're not having to do mtDNA or yDNA ancestry just because of the size of the database is, is really the go-to place. So the thing is, when you're doing this kind of a thing, the more people that you can test, the better. So just to explain that a little bit, this chart represents, if we're trying to figure out who the great-grandfather is, he's got obviously 100% of his own DNA. He passes 50% of that to his grandfather, or to his son, which is my dad's grandfather. That grandfather then passes it down to um, my dad's mother, two of his uncles, and an aunt. They each get 25%, roughly, statistically, about 25% of that great-grandfather's DNA. So what happens there, if you look at that, is the first mother, has 25% of DNA. The uncle's not gonna get the exact same 25%. He's gonna get scattered around pieces of that, which statistically means if you combine the two of them, you get about 37.5% of that great-grandfather's original DNA. If you add another person into the mix, then you end up about 43 and three quarters percent. And if you can add a fourth person, you get 46.88% on average statistically. But the idea is the more descendants that you can add, the more pieces of that DNA you'll get. The same thing happened with my, my family. We weren't able to test my mother. She died when I was younger. So I have tested myself and four of my siblings. And by doing that, we're up around, I can't remember the number, I think it's like 98% of her DNA, roughly, that we'll be able to recreate when I have time to focus on that instead of this. So what happens when we test more siblings? This is just a really rough chart that shows the relationship between four siblings and a first cousin once removed. Does this make sense to everyone? Okay, so on the left side, there's four siblings. They're, they have a common grandparent with a first cousin once removed, okay? So if we test each of those siblings, here's what happened, at least in my case. Of those four, there are six people that are fourth cousin or better on Ancestry's database that matched all four of them. That, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't say that right. There are six people that had that first cousin once removed in common for each of those four. Does that make sense? I'm not sure I'm saying that real clearly, but anyway. There's six of those people. If you ran an in common uh, report between those, you'd see six people that all four of those share. Two of them share another five people that they have in common with that person. So that first person on the left, if you had only tested them, you'd miss out on all five of these. You would never see them. The last person has 11 people. That's all of those other ones combined. In addition to what they already have, that person has 11 people that share that first cousin in common, but the other three siblings don't even have. This is actually from my family. This is a real test. Now, in this particular case, I think all 11 of those are from the mother's side, which I'm not interested in, in digging into at this point, but it could have been just as easily the father's side. So if you don't test everybody that you can possibly test, if you don't test every sibling in this kind of a situation, you're missing out on a lot of opportunity as far as extra DNA. Yes? Is the same 11 people? No. Those 11 people only show up on that person's match list. They might be further down. Now, these are only, this is with Ancestry's shared matches, so it's fourth cousin or better. So these might be show up in Ancestry's fifth or sixth cousin or something, so they don't show up. But if, if Ancestry is the only tool you're using, you'd still be losing out on those. And I guess it, it 
kind of stands to reason that if that's happening further up on the list, then probably there's people further down that you're not seeing either. Are you saying that the four siblings uh, have six matches that also match to the first cousin once removed? That's correct. And then two of the siblings have an additional five that match with the first uh, cousin removed? That's correct. Okay. And then that last one has an additional 11 that matches that person. Okay. So in the process of this, absolutely running his DNA, but you don't want to neglect traditional research. You still have to do your digging. You never know when new records are going to come up. You never know when there's going to be, you know, somebody adds something to their tree that's critical to you. Um, I know it's tempting for me. I'm, I, I annoyed a lot of people that grew up my first year there because I said if it wasn't for DNA, I probably wouldn't be actively doing genealogy. They didn't like that very much. <laughs> but I still, I mean, I, I was doing genealogy beforehand. I just wasn't nearly as active as I am now. So it's, I have to keep reminding myself to go back and relook and relook and keep looking at the records to make sure everything's coming in. So one of the things you have to make sure to do is build your trees and keep building your trees and build past where you think you need to build. You want to build up as far as you can. Obviously, that's what we're all trying to do is get up as far as we can. But then you also want to build out. And I know that I have particular um, relatives in this area that I need to dig into more. So I build up to the, the mystery person and then I build out as far as I can. And then you build down to go. And what that does is that helps you get matches um, that, that you might not otherwise get. You get those DNA hints. It just kind of helps you to, to track things down a little bit quicker. You get surnames in your tree that aren't directly related to you, but might help you track down relatives that you wouldn't know are your relatives otherwise. It just gives you a little bit of a head start. Contact your cousins. Contact your cousins, contact your cousins, contact your cousins. Anybody that you have a match with along the line that you want to match, that you want to dig into, send them an email. And you know, there's a couple of things you have to do. You, you probably know this, but be courteous. Um, the thing that I always do is ask for help. There's, I, I read, I don't know where I read this years ago, but it was an article that I read that basically said, if you ask somebody for help, they're much more inclined to actually respond to you and help you out. So when I email somebody, I say, I'm trying to find my dad's great grandfather's family. My dad's 93 years old. I want to find this while he's still around. And I make it very clear. I make an emotional appeal. I make it very clear to them why this is important. And I believe that I actually get better responses because of that. And it's also not so threatening to people. It doesn't feel like I'm just trying to sort of invade their family tree and find out all their secrets and stuff. It's, it's strictly for what I want to get. Yes. You're going to have that where people just respond badly. I had, I had one that we weren't DNA matches. Um, but we were, we had shared ancestors in our family trees and he reached out to me and it was on my mother's side. And I told him that I had an extra DNA kit. I'd be happy to send him. And a week went by, I was busy, hadn't sent it yet. I got an email from him and he said, everybody in this family is all the same. You know, you can't be trusted. And <laughs> it was kind of crazy. So I emailed him back and said, well, yeah, sorry you feel that way. Um, I'm going to keep the kit. <laughs> so. It, you know, it's, we do the best that we can to make connections with people and some people you just, you just can't help how they respond. That's the way it goes. Yeah, you know, when you're, when you're dealing with people that are real private, private, sometimes it just takes time and you have to, there was one in our family that my aunt told me he's very secluded, he doesn't want to be part of the family. He had a big falling out. He doesn't want to deal with it. So I just introduced myself and left it at that. And I, I think I offered to share information or something like that. It was strictly one way I was offering. And then I didn't do anything else. And, and about a year later, he contacted me with a question. I answered it and threw in a little extra information. And now he contacts me all the time and asks for things. And, and I've helped him with some things. So it, sometimes it's just patience. It depends on what the problem is that you're trying to solve. If it's along your, your father's line, then why won't help you on your mother's line? Then? Why is strictly on the, on the male line? So it's not going to 
it's not going to help you there. Okay. Well, if it's if that's a line that you want to research, then you know I I would wait for the right opportunity. Uh, try to find a way to make it worthwhile to him too, that he's going to get some benefit from it, and above all, always be very courteous and deferential and respectful. And see what happens. The other thing that you have to know too is if you're calling people asking to test, you're probably going to have to pay for the test. So, I mean, to call somebody and say, hey, would you drop 100 bucks to help me out is probably not the, the best solution in the world. So um, I keep tests on hand, and, and when an opportunity comes up, you know, I want to take advantage of it. So contact your cousins. We already showed you how more people testing. You know, we talk about siblings, but it's true for cousins. I mean, the more people that you have on this line that you test, the more data you're going to have, and the more data you have, the better chance you have of solving so I did all those things, pulled everything together, um, started kind of digging into the search, and a few things started happening. Started to get cousin matches popping up, not people that I had contacted, not people that I knew of. And it's, it's I mean, it's now to the case where it's probably every other week I have somebody pop up that's a fairly close connection to someone that I've either, either tested or that has shared their results for me. By the way, that's another thing with the contact cousins. Reach out to people that are key matches in your line that have a tree. Well, even if they don't have a tree, reach out to them. But if they, if they are part of the line that you're looking for, and the more people that you get tested by using the shared matches, you'll be able to tell probably if these people are in that line. Now, all of this is going to take more research, but, but you can get there and then come back in and fill in the holes. So if these people are on the line that you're looking for, you obviously want to ask them to test if they haven't tested. Ask them if they have relatives that will test. Ask them if there's anybody that you can get to test. Um, and then what was I getting at on that? Anyway, um, they'll start popping up. And you'll start seeing trees. You'll start seeing names that look familiar because they start coming up a lot. And, and some of the pieces will start falling into place. As I said, you don't want to just build out your tree. You also want to take these people. You've seen the trees where it has one person, their parents, and nothing else. I know it's infuriating. But build those trees out. Bring them over to your, you know, create a new tree, copy the person's name over, and see if you can start building it out. I had one I built out. The person's name was... Totally ambiguous. It didn't. It didn't. It wasn't actually a name. It was just a, a fake name that they used. But they had they had one parent and one grandparent on the other side, and that was enough that I was able to start building the tree out. And I went back. I don't know five generations. Didn't see any surnames that looked familiar. So I just set it aside, and it was one of my hundred trees that I've built in ancestry that are just sitting there. And about three months ago. Something happened where I found a common match to that person, and I was curious, and I remembered I had a tree farm. I went back and looked, and there was a name, which I'll show you in a minute, that jumped off the page at me, and I realized that it was an important name. So sometimes you'll be doing work now that will be important a couple of months from now, and you just won't realize it. So it's probably good not to throw a tree away if you think it's not important. Keep it and see, see what happens. I found one of the key moments was when I found a third cousin once removed, that had a match to my dad. And as I looked at their tree, there was a Mary Kay in Lancaster, England. And you remember one of the things that I said about William Henry Jones, his mother's name was Mary Kay. And her father's name was Andrew Kay. This person had Mary Kay, and the father's name was Andrew Kay. And I thought, I'm there, I've solved it. Her husband's name was George Simpson, not George Jones. So then I had the question of, is this the right couple? Was he born before they were married? Was he born out of wedlock? You know, it, so it created more questions than, than I had before, but there were better questions and they were closer. And the Simpson name is the name that this other person had in their tree. So, so that was another piece of the puzzle. Remember I said that I had built this tree, Simpson was the name, and it went back to this same exact couple, Mary, or same, father and daughter, Mary Kay and Andrew Kay. So then I had another cousin show up, and they had a Simpson connection. 
And then I also had the mystery cousin that I talked about a little bit earlier that showed up, and she also has a trail back to the same Simpson family. Now, the tricky thing is Andrew Kay, his wife's name is Elizabeth Waterhouse, and I have no connections to her at all. I've found nobody that matches anyone named Waterhouse in my tree, or at least Waterhouses that are in England or anything like that. So it's another clue, it's another piece, but it's nothing conclusive. So I take everything that I've got, and it's time to kind of sit back and, and have a reality check. And this part is as complicated as it's gonna get tonight, and hopefully it's complicated in a way that's gonna make your, your work a little bit simpler in the future. How many of you have seen a McGuire chart? Okay, excellent. Um, can you read that? I was worried it wouldn't be very legible. Is it readable? Yeah. All right, it's a little bit small. I'll try to talk through it as I go. The idea of a McGuire chart is that you, you build your tree with the person that you're trying to, to solve for, basically, at the top of the tree, and you build everything down. Everybody that you've tested related to that person is in the bottom row of each of these columns. And if you look at it, you can see there's a whole bunch under William H. Jones. I have a little blurry line there because I'm not sure if that connects in that way or not. But you see I've got um, on the far left, the bottom person, is, it says four sibling average. That's basically my dad and his three siblings. I took their information and averaged it. Because if you, can, if you can do that kind of thing and average it, it gives you a little bit better of a number, a, a more balanced number. The next one is um, my dad's aunt's grandchildren, two different ones. Then we've got another aunt. We've got a grandchild, her three daughters, who are all in their 90s. And I was lucky enough, they all agreed to test. And it was awesome. The, I called the one and told her what I was trying to do, and she got all excited. And she enlisted her two sisters. One is, let's see, one's 93. She got her two sisters that were 98 and 103 to test. So that was a good day in my house. Uh, and then we have another granddaughter of that aunt there. Then you move completely out of the William Jones descendants into the Simpson descendants. And you've got this Stanislaus Simpson, Simpson is the son of Mary Kane, Henry Simpson. And we've got three of his great grandchildren. Um, now I'm trying to remember who some of these initials are. Um, one of them is a person that I found on, actually all of those are people that I found on Ancestry that have either uh, shared their results with me or I'm in the process of asking them to share their results with me. One way you can tell is as, you, as we get further into this, I'll tell you what the numbers below mean, but anywhere there's not a number, that's probably a column where I haven't gotten the person to share their results with me yet, so I haven't been able to get the specific matching numbers for them. But then in the far right column is the person that I was saying kind of broke this open for me. Uh, she immediately shared her results with me, and she goes straight back to the brother of Mary Kay, Richard Kay. And um, she has, kind of, because of that connection, that's allowed me, if I do shared matches, if I look at shared matches between my dad and her, then barring anything weird, which can happen, you know that it can happen, you get weird relationships and things like that. But barring anything weird, somebody that matches my dad and matches her is probably a descendant of Andrew Kay and or, or not or, but Andrew Kay, and then we're still trying to figure out the Mary, Mary Waterhouse thing. By the way, if you haven't figured it out from the way I'm talking, this is going to be a very disappointing story because I don't have the answer at the end. I'll warn you that right now. One of the worst presentations I ever saw in DNA was somebody that didn't have the answer, told us all how to do it, and got to the end and went, surprise, I still don't know what the solution is. Hopefully, I'm close enough that you'll feel a little bit of closure. Maybe the next time I'm here, like in the next meeting, I'll be able to tell you that you've finally wrapped it up. I wanted to, I wanted to hold off on this. I was, I've, always, I've been thinking about this kind of a presentation for a long time, but the knee arose before I was fully finished, so I hope you will forgive the uh, semi-anticlimactic finish. So anyways, this is how a McGuire chart works. You build everybody out like that, and then if you look, you see the lines that go down, and you have these columns of data, basically. And it basically is a table where, if you look at the far left, you've got the four sibling average. If you go down that line, then it goes across, and this one, it says 398 centimorgans, first cousin once removed. 
That's the relationship to MS. That's the nut, that's the size of their connection. And also, um, there's two different ways to do this. One is what you think the relationship is based on the DNA. The other is what the actual relationship is based on where they fit into the chart. Um, if you know exactly where everybody fits, then that's it's easy to do the actual relationship. Then you can match the numbers to it, which is the way I do it. Um, so as you go across and as you look down, you can cross-reference. It gives you a really quick reference for how everybody connects to everybody else. And it really gives you sort of a reality check for how everything works. I know the person that the McGuire that this is named after, and she sat down with me when, it, when she first wrote a blog post about it, and she was explaining it to me, and I thought, well, that's really interesting if you're really into, like, data and the numbers and everything like that, but I, I just, I want to get that bogged down in it. So I kind of avoided it for a while. The day that I finally did this, it's like my, all of my research just kind of opened up and suddenly made so much more sense. And I had kind of a general sense in my head of how all these people fit together, but once I did this, it made so much more sense. Oh, does everybody recognize this chart? Does anybody not recognize this chart? Okay, so this is the chart that Blaine Bettinger developed as part of the Shared Santa Morgan Project. You may also know the green chart that you see on Facebook a lot, um, or the charts that we have on ISDOG's database, um, or data and statistics page. There's a couple of different variations, Basically, this is, this is what you see. This is one of those charts that lets you look up yourself, look up a relative, and see what the size of the match is supposed to be. There's a variation of this that probably a lot of you are aware of. How many, is, how many of you are aware of DNA Painter? Oh, good. So this will be a little bit of a surprise for some of you. DNA Painter is a website that allows you to, to um, basically crumble painting. And it's a very powerful site. But I'm not going to confuse you. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm just going to talk about one of the tools that does have this really, really awesome. I mean, everything about it is awesome. I encourage you to go there. Um, I don't remember if he's taking donations now or not, but if you have the ability to donate, support him. Don Crow is the developer of the site. He's doing some of the most interesting things for our community as far as developing new tools for people. And one tool that they've got developed that's still in beta, that's sort of super secret beta, it's not really secret, but it's not available to the public yet, that kind of takes, uh, gives you some of the power of the McGuire chart. So um, between that and the ability to do this chromosome painting and also the ability to do what I'm going to do here, it's just it's a no-brainer to support this guy. I can tell you that, that if we want to have great tools, we have to support the people that are developing tools. What his site does is this is that same chart I took you a second ago, but you the ability to go and you enter a number and you say, my match is this many cent organs, you enter it. And it gives you this chart. And the parts that are highlighted are the potential matches. And the rest of it's done. So it makes it, I mean, it's just this chart that you always see, but it makes it a little easier. Here's where the real magic of it is. It also gives you this little table. And this tool is called this, the Shared Centimorgan Tool 4.0. When you enter the number of centimorgans, it tells you the centimorgans, but it also tells you the probability of that range being the correct range. So in this particular example, if, pers if I think the person is a second cousin once removed, it's telling me that there's a, the probability is 45.08% that that's correct, which is really, really powerful. Now, we can do a whole conversation about how probability works. And it'll make your head spin around and, and things like that. But uh, 45.0, especially compared to those other probabilities, is, is probably fairly um, something you really need to look seriously at. Let's put it that way. So, by using this tool and then going and combining it with the McGuire, it kind of makes the stuff wake up and disagree a little bit. So, this is the part that you saw before through all those that I need links for and uh, put in the probability of match based on what we had there. And here's the probabilities. What do you saw that you there? You can call it code to make it easy. The far right one, the probability of those is in the range of 14 to 16-ish. 
which tells me something. Now, the thing you have to know, you can't just say, well, if it was 90, it would be a good thing, and if it's 15, it's a bad thing. The problem is when you get that far up, you're never going to get probability above, say, I think on this particular one, uh, about 31% was the highest probability you can get at that distance because there's so many different uh, relationships that could be that distance. So you're not going to get something that just says this is the way it is. But 14% makes me at least stop and think about it a little bit and kind of wonder. And all of these matches are a little bit small for the distance range that they should be. A lot of them are about half where you would expect them to be. Now, there's two reasons that that would be. What would they be? Why would those be about half what you'd expect them to be? Yeah, so there could be half things. There could be some sort of half relationship in there. The other thing is, it's very possible that, that Ruke just inherited a little bit less DNA from his father than the average. And then the cousin K, daughter, inherited a little bit less than the average. And it could have just eroded over time. But the fact that they're all, I mean, they're all going to be that distance because they're all comparing to CR. If CR is low, that would be an explanation for that. But I think it's really worth looking into that I have been, especially in the story that we know. So what I know is that Mary Kay is the name that he gave. Andrew Kay is the name he gave. I've got a bunch of matches for the Kay. So that seems pretty good. Henry Simpson is not the name that he gave. He didn't the name Henry, but Henry's just as bad as William in England at that period of time. Where he was named Henry. And half of them were named William and Henry or Henry Williams. So the thing is, that surname Simpson never shows up anywhere in the family history or anything like that. So it's very possible in this information course an idea that could be that Mary Kay had William with different different men. He has a different father. It could be that it's further back. That Henry Simpson is the father, but William Jones is not actually comes from the next generation back. Okay, but he's not his Henry and Mary Kay would be his aunt and uncle. I don't know. I have to I have to research for a network call building the tree back building over. The problem is some of the people don't have anywhere to move their feet. So a lot of my is on that side stop at Andrew K. So back and see if Andrew K had parents who so he had siblings and all that kind of stuff. So there's, there's a little bit of digging I still have to do there. Bring closer, closer and closer. And as I go, this is sort of falling falling into place. So what are the next steps? Like I said, I want to build out the tree, especially around that area that I'm, that I'm interested in. I want to see if I can find out that um, K's, who their siblings are, who their uncles are. I want to build all of that out so that if I have any other matches to that area, I'll know. One of the things, any of the people that I have shared matches to um, along this line, uh, that part of Lancashire, just it lights up when they have the, the locations in Ancestry. So you can go in and click on the location part. You can see, you can see the pedigree, the surnames. You can go to the middle tab, and it's uh, what's the middle tab? You got the, the pedigree, you've got um, shared matches, and the, thank you. And you've got the map. If you go to the map, all of these matches have like a journal. It's and, and there's names, the name Lee, the name Bennett, um, the name Ashworth, and there's about three or four other ones that Holmes is another one, three or four other ones that just come up constantly. And I have to figure out they fit in. And they may not fit in, fit in at all. It could be a coincidence. The name that doesn't come up a lot is Jones. So it's, it just takes a little more reading. So I'm going to keep asking people to test the one person who time back, I was looking at a match and trying to figure out how their tree connected. And one of the people in their tree um, was doing a search on Ancestry, and I found someone who wasn't a DNA-tested person, but was just a regular Ancestor user that had that same line in their tree, emailed them and asked them some questions. And we corresponded periodically. He's very helpful. And I first talked to Opera to send him a kit. 
if you would test. And I said, my only stipulation is that you share the results. Happy to get together. Every other question I ask except for that one, uh, he doesn't want to do it. He just emailed me yesterday, day before yesterday, and said, hey, I just had an idea. I've been building up my tree, and remember this person was related to you, you think, and you should check into this. And so I took the opportunity and said, hey, I offered to send you a kit. Is that something you're interested in? And he said, oh, well, I'm going to be, but I already sent him a kit a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, it didn't didn't work, so the ancestry sent him a new test. But I know now there's going to be another person in this long I'll be getting results for so there's a situation where I asked about the time, I didn't even have to pay for it. So huge win. Um, you see this bulb spot? It's just, it's, it's just a word. You just have to, I mean, you just have to dig in and go level by level and, and lose out and some of it you're not going to figure out. Some of it hopefully you can find out people that match up through that I'll figure it out. Um, without knowing the exact situation, I'm sure I can really answer this. Um, you know, point in the right direction right after that, but if you want to talk afterwards. Uh, yeah, from, from what I've been able to see and some of the things that I've been able to pick up, there were a few very rich family. Uh, to the point where um, both, both right now, for a long time, but also just from being on time saying, I, I have a feeling that the only way that they would have been death or you know. um, yeah, so and there may have been a chance the that my great grandfather gave his birthright was. Right in the middle of these other kids, where Mary Kay was the mother and uh, William Simpson, Henry Simpson was the father. So if he's right in the middle, then he would have to be either on wedlock or one of their kids. And I can find no birth records, no census that shows him in there. My suspicion is that he's actually a lot older than he was. And that he didn't stow away on a ship when he was 12, that he actually came over when he was 20 something. So he was probably older than all these kids, but I don't know for sure. Not yet. Yeah, they can. It's, it's going to take just a lot of work and a lot of research. And like with the, the water, I don't have anybody that matches her. And that's like the maybe that just her DNA just didn't be passed down somehow. Eventually, after five or six or seven generations, but it does. So it, it does. Like this, so this lead, I was saying this. It's L E A. Well, it's L E A. Um, but it would be that of that relationship. But I have found a record of that. But today, I'm looking through some records and I see Sarah Lee and because. And the next thing I'll think is, wait a minute, and I'll see that she married, you know, Andrew Kay or something like that. So it all makes sense. Because it just takes digging to get that. So, hello? <laughs> all right, so as many people as you can to test. You never know where to put the one that is sort of the magical one that solves the problem. And again, any descendants of those people, ask them to test. It never hurts to ask. And like I said, sometimes it's a year later that that it bears fruit. Just keep at it. So the things that we haven't talked about tonight, really, visual phasing, chromosome mapping, DNA, dead time. I know that you guys have covered that a little bit. Jed match, especially if you want to get a killer place to go. Um, ADS, there's all these other tools. Um, I'm trying to teach you tonight is absolutely learn to use those tools. And you know, they're a valuable bit in your toolbox, but you don't have to use those tools to find the answers that you need to find. You can actually solve most of what you're trying to solve without ever being ancestry. Yes. Medbetter DNA um, 
and I might miss something here, so if anybody knows better, correct me. It's an extension that runs in Chrome, and it allows you to put comments with your matches. So if you have a match, um, like for mine, I could say, you know, this is a fourth or third great grandchild of Mary Kay. And then I could make a note about who, um, who the common matches are or whatever. And then I think you can even do hashtags. Like you could say, you know, Kay or Jones or something like that. And what happens is when you then look at your list of matches, like Ancestry let, lets you do comments. But if you look at your list of matches, you have no idea. With this extension, the comments show up in the match list. So you can, you can get a much better idea. And you can search by the hashtags or anything in the comments. No, it may have originally. So it's it's actually a really, really, it's, it's an extension that I wish Ancestry actually did. Because if, if I went through and I just put a hashtag for everybody that was on this line and just said, you know, K and Jones or something like that, I can come back and search for K and it'll show me all the people that have that hashtag. So you can develop your own techniques for using it, but it's actually a pretty powerful tool. And that you can use it. It works in Ancestry, so it supports my theory that you can do all sorts of stuff in Ancestry. No, I don't. Anyway, um, yes? When you were talking about uh, DNA painting, mm -hmm. I'm working out a little bit and trying to get more proficient out of the art in the future. But you said that there's a super bad behind the scenes. Was one of the things you were showing us behind the scenes? No. Now, what I was showing you is live now. Okay. So when you go to DNA Painter's homepage, there's a little graphic that says it's got four different tools. Two of them are just different versions of the same tool, 3.0 and 4.0. If you click on the 4.0 one, that takes you to the tool where you can enter the number of centimorgans, and it'll tell you the match and the probability. So, um, And uh, Ancestry DNA Helper is a great example of why I'm basically pleading with you to support Johnny Pearl because DNA Painter is a great tool. Ancestry DNA Helper, how many of you have tried to use that in the last six months? How many of you love it? Ancestry DNA Helper was a great tool, and especially if you're a Mac user, it hasn't worked on a Mac for nine months. I actually uh, got a Windows machine just so I could run it. It has worked really, really haphazardly on Windows for, for probably six months now at least. And the guys, Jeff Snape has got a full-time job, He's got other things he's, he has to do. He's sick of supporting this thing because he developed for himself. He wanted it, so he rolled it out and said, here you go. And it turned into this big thing. And he's had to update it every time that's after it's an update. So he likes to mail or not a big thing, but just at least a little bit. So um, it, it, it helps to support people in the community that are developing tools for us. That's, that's all I'm going to say about that. So. Don't be discouraged. It's going to be frustrating. Uh, like I said, there's a lot of times where you think you did a dead end. I thought that I wasn't going to do a test. So I thought that was a dead end. I thought the tree that I had built wasn't ever going to bear fruit. So I thought that was a dead end. There's the other trees that I've done that this isn't burning fruit. But things come back around. As you learn more, you suddenly start to be able to be clear. And every bit of work that you do could help you solve the problem. So keep, plugging, keep digging at it. By the way, that last is neither half full nor empty. It's the wrong size. Um, but learning your race, um, one of the things that I think is bad for our community is that we get beginners, get excited, and want to learn about maybe just see if they have Native, Native American, because we know everybody does for that. Um, and they want to learn a little bit more. So they go on Facebook or they do a blog or, they, or something like that, and all of a sudden they're hit with, you know, chromosome and all these different words and they go on in the group and there's people talking about real competitions and how to do it like that. And I think it's important for us. We need to understand that there's a lot that you can do very, very simply. And I think this is actually, Ancestry gets a lot of heat, not as much as they used to, but they take a lot of heat for not having from other. They take a lot of heat for not having much more elaborate tools and things like that. And I think this is one of the reasons they do it the way that they do, because they want it to be accessible.
and they get these people that come in and all they do, all their advertising is on their heritage. Because the advertising that works, it's why they sign millions and millions of people. And we hope that when the people get into the database, they'll be interested enough to maybe build a little tree, not to match and things like that. So I believe in that approach. We have an advanced user where you can have Chrome's on browser and some of those other things. One of the things to all memories with the things that the best gives you. So, um, if you want to learn more, look at Blaine Bender's books. Um, his, his Facebook group is everybody in Blaine's Facebook group. If you're on Facebook, in that group, it's, a, it's an awesome place to ask questions. It, it, I have been in you know, Facebook and seen a lot of really negative conversations and things like that. I've never seen a group like this. They have in chat in a while. I think like 30,000 users. And you never see a fight. You never see people trolling. You never see negative conversations. It's always very helpful, very supportive. So genealogy tips in that we really recommend that. So um, I found this picture yesterday when I'm looking for a picture of Alucard. And if you look at the far right, I think that's it. I don't care if it's not, I'm just going with it, okay? Found people post those on the internet. The person who's like those. But this one is really is. So, any questions? I'll read it. The, the question is whether we can get DNA from people who, have, are, who are deceased. Um, the answer is yes, but for our purposes, generally, the DNA is, is rolling out the capability to extract DNA from things, so it would be maybe a tooth or a um, lock of hair or something like that. With hair, it has to have the roots in it, so it could be from somebody's haircut. Um, and then, you know, there's just a lot of things like a stamp, and there's uh, there is technology to be able to see things like that, the kind of technology that, that you know, forensic scientists may use may not be the same technology that the labs that do our stuff may use. I don't know. So it's it will be possible. It's not readily available for us right now. I would say if you have something like that, if you have a lot of hair with root on it or you know, a hairbrush or something like that, hold on to it. Keep it sealed in a plastic bag because you don't want to contaminate it with your own DNA. Um, it's probably too late for most of that. But but if it's something where the DNA is locked away and it's protected, then then you know you may be able to do something with that at some point. And I think that's far away. I think you know in the next five years or so that capability will probably become much more common. Yeah. Would you agree though that if we're on Gen I know you said we're moving people, but Yes. The, the question is whether you can use the Lazarus tool on GEDmatch if you have enough people tested to recreate someone's DNA. Um, I have four siblings. I have my mother's brother, and then I have some nieces. We used all of them, and even that um, did it recreated. I don't know. I would say it was probably somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of DNA, and I expected more. Um, I think I've heard some people say that the Lazarus tool probably isn't as up to date as it would be with technology and things like that. But it could do a much better job. The other thing I'd like to see it do is to be able to. Um, there's a bunch of things that it could do where it could combine matches and things like that to, to help recreate. Um, DNA is something that's not under Yeah. 
the question is if you can get DNA off a of letter. It's the same thing. I would say it's probably possible, but it would probably be very expensive, and the technology is probably not quite there for our purposes yet. Yes. Yes. Um, the question is, uh, if you can take advance, I haven't taken any beginning parts. Grip is a uh, genealogical research institute. It's an excellent institute. It's a week long program. You can stay on campus, you can stay off campus too. But um, it, the, in the industry, uh, come and teach you everything now. And it's, it's awesome. It's a really good program. If you can do it for a week, I highly recommend it. Um, I, I do, it's been a year since I've been there. I believe they have the, the requirement that you take a beginner class, but I think you can um, convince them if there's something else that you've taken that would be an equivalent. They'll let you take the next class. What is it? I suspect they're happy to take your money as long as you can. <laughs> Yeah, as long as you can convince them that you're not just going to be lost. Um, they do have a lot of people that want to take it. It's pretty high demand, but I think if you can find a way, they're they're very reasonable people. They're really nice ladies that run it. Um, so I would, I would, when you want to register, I'd email them and explain it. And do it. Anybody else? Yes. 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 That's an interesting question. I don't, I don't know. But the question was whether there's organizations that are um, in place to collect DNA samples of hair or whatever, basically for posterity's sake. Uh, I'm not aware of any. And if the person's going to be able to donate their saliva, then you could probably just send it to ancestries. But that part at least would be the result. There is a big conversation going on right now about what to do with people's data that have tested in that way. Um, some sort of organization or group that will uh, take responsibility for it. There's no next of kin or whatever that will want to be responsible for it so this information isn't lost. The group that's working on how it will be done. Is that accessible to anyone other than um, the question is whether um, DNA is collected by police departments is accessible to anybody else. Um, there's two issues with that. One is uh, I suspect the police departments probably have some privacy law that they have to respect as far as not sharing that. The other is that um, the way police departments test the DNA, they actually test all markers. Our test are 750,000. So if they still have the DNA sample, they could probably test. And that's what they did with the Golden State Court and those kind of things. Anybody else? So the just get started with it. They gave each other kits for Christmas. Uh, they got their results. They looked them up. And you're never going to do it. You're never going to talk back on ancestry. Um, they got their little data and they got all their So the, the the question um, or observation, I, I know what your question is. I'll, I'll give you a question, actually. The the observation is that you have a lot of people that will test at Ancestry just because they want to get the chart and see where they're from and be able to say that they, you know, should be wearing a later hosen or a kilt or whatever. Um, and and that's, if, if you spend any time in any of the Facebook groups, you'll see the post. I saw one today as I was getting ready 
that said, I can't believe these people, they go and test and they don't even post a tree and it drives me crazy and why do they do it? And then somebody else, well-meaning, will jump in and say, well, you can just block there so you never have to see it. If you're in these groups, you have probably seen me reply because I'm one of the ones that always replies to these because they bother me almost as much as the trees without, or the, the matches without trees. In my opinion, any match is a good match. Even if there's no tree or anything else, I don't know if that person won't come back at some point and add a tree. I can email that person and try to convince them that, it, that there's something altruistic in helping me out. Um, that match, I may be able to find matches that we have in common that I might not have looked at otherwise because that by ma looking at the shared matches with that person, I can see a group of people that share with this person, even though I don't know who that person is. So I would, and what I always say is, I would rather have a person test and know they're a match, even though I don't know who they are or what their family history is, than have them not test at all. Because at least there's an opportunity that someday that'll bear some sort of fruit for me. So that's how I counsel everybody on that one. I, I know it's, it's frustrating to see a match with no tree, but every once in a while a tree shows up too. Yeah, it's a good point that that you should if you don't match with somebody send them an email talk about mention the surnames that you have ask if they have a match. Uh, there's there's generally one of two kinds of people that doesn't have a tree. One is they just did it for fun and they were just curious, in which case your email where you explain everything and be very clear about what you're trying to learn will help a great deal. Yeah, most of the time there's a tree, they just don't put it up. Uh, yeah. That's not the result. Yeah. yeah, Kelly said that most of the time there's a tree, they just don't put it up. That's an excellent point too. Um, you'll see a lot of people that will respond to those questions uh, that one disappeared too quickly. What did it say? Search the member directory for their name. That's excellent advice. Um, a lot of. Yeah, one of our experts. Um, a lot of people, uh, you'll see a lot of responses on these Facebook groups that'll basically say, I don't have a tree up because there's some things in my tree that I'm not sure about and I'm experimenting and I don't want people to get bad information or, you know, there's all sorts of reasons you never know until you contact them. Anything else? Yes. Last question. Last question. All right. Surnames you mentioned, my dad came over, that he came over from Lebanon or Syria and they're Ellis Island gave them to me. Uh -huh. And they said, okay, we'll take it. You know, but we think it was S D A T T Y S D A, which sounds kind of Arabic or Phoenician. Uh -huh. Is that necessary to have the surname to be well, for DNA, you don't have to have the surname, but ultimately if your goal is building your tree, you're gonna need a surname. Um but this is, you said this is your dad's dad? Yeah. That's still the. Well, I, I have great news for you. Um, the Y DNA test that we were talking about earlier, that particular test goes along the male line. So it's your dad, his dad, his dad, his dad. And you'll, the only people that you match with with that test are people that match you along that line. And with, with autosomal DNA, you only go back. Um, depending on who you talk to, seven to ten generations ish, can does the data really help you? With the Y DNA test, it can go back thousands of years even. So you can you can find people that match you, um, and and generally if it if it works well, uh, I've done it twice on two different lines in my family. One of them was my name's Nedry, and I searched, and the top eight matches were all named Nethery. And we had believed that our ancestors were Netheries and they changed their name to Nedry. And that just, I mean, that, that just brought it home. The other side, the name was Thurber, which had been changed from Sloan. And all of the matches on that side were different names. There was Carol O'Carroll. There was um, 
Vaca. There was, there was a whole bunch of different names. So we have no idea what's going on on that side. But that test might help you actually figure out what that name goes back to. Yes? So for those of you online, the two comments were um, why DNA can be great or it may not tell you anything. Uh, Ashkenazi Jewish is crazy when it comes to DNA. Good luck. And there was a country that made people change their surnames and we're not sure, we're not sure which one it was. That's the short version. Any other questions? Yes. Hmm. Um, the question is on Jedmatch, if you can take, um, she has uh, a half sibling, and it's just the two of you, or was the, okay, so two of you are tested, okay. You're the main two, okay. So the two of them are tested. Uh, the question is whether there's some way on GEDmatch to um, pull the segments that they share in common with certain other people to create um, their mother's DNA. Um, the, um, the Lazarus tool will get you a little ways. Um, oh, yeah, yeah. And that's especially when you're dealing with a half. So it's, oh, well, that's awesome. Ashkenazi, yeah. Um, yeah, I, 
I don't know if there's, I'm waiting to see if something pops up. I don't know if there's an easy way. Um, you could, I mean, if you were really, really patient, you could probably do it manually. Um, really, really patient and had a lot of time on your hands. You could go through and look at all the places that you match and that kind of thing. But um, that's, that's the kind of tool that there have been a few of us that have been um, starting to make more and more noise that somebody that is a developer that has time on their hands probably needs to come out with something similar to Lazarus, but that has more capabilities. So um, Blaine Bettinger has talked about, and I'm not going to get it right, so I'm just going to be very vague, but he's talked about being able to use the um, evil twin tool as a, sort, as a way of sort of doing phasing. This is where it gets complicated for some people. Um, but by using the results of the evil twin tool and a sort of a Lazarus tool kind of approach, you can recreate, like I could recreate my mother's DNA by, by using all of that stuff. Um, but there's no tool that does that right now. So hopefully at some point somebody will, yeah. Probably more likely what will happen is Ancestry or someone like Ancestry will just do something that skips right by it. Because I think where we're going to wind up, it's the same, you know, if you look at the history of operating systems on computers, there was, initially they were very, very complicated and then it became easier and easier. And now it's, you don't even have to think about what you do. I think DNA is going to ultimately be that same way that you're going to get to a point where you you know you have your test done and it comes back and says here's what you know here's here's you know what you can figure out about your tree based on the people that match you and stuff like that it's that's quite a ways away but I think that's where it's going to go so somebody will develop a tool like that and then the technology will jump right over them. anybody else all right well thank you thank